Hello and welcome to the Hubble Space Telescope's 30th anniversary image unveiling webcast. We're so glad you could join us for this special event. I'm Dr. Frank Summers of the Office of Public Outreach at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And joining me later in the program will be Dr. Elena Sabi, also of the Space Telescope Science Institute. Now, you may think this program has been 30 years in the making, but actually, Hubble as an idea goes back much further. It goes back to the 1940s when Lyman Spitzer wrote a seminal paper imagining the benefits of a telescope located in space. That was a full decade before Sputnik started the space age and went before NASA was uh, created. In the 1960s, the idea of a space telescope became a recommendation from the National Academy of Sciences. And in the 1970s, that vision was finally funded by Congress and the European Space Agency. In the mid-90s, 1985, Hubble had been constructed and it was launched on this day 30 years ago in 1990. So for 30 years, we have had the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit. And people sort of ask, well, wait a minute, why Hubble? What makes it so special? Well, the first thing is that Hubble has the three things that every real estate agent wants. It has location, location, and location. After all, space is its middle name. And by being located in space, it gets the clearest view of any telescope. I mean, you look at this image and you can see that the clouds are beneath Hubble. And that's the point. The clouds are underneath Hubble. Hubble is up above it. The ground-based telescopes have to look through that atmosphere and they do not get as clear an image as Hubble. But Hubble being out into space is not that far out into space. Here in this diagram, you can see this is a, the size of Earth is about 6,400 kilometers in radius. Earth's atmosphere is a very thin layer around that. That's only 100 kilometers above the surface. Hubble gets up above that atmosphere, but not that far above. It's only 600 kilometers above the surface. So Hubble goes far enough to get above the atmosphere, but doesn't go really, really far out into space. This is an orbit that we call low Earth orbit. And that provides another advantage to Hubble because that is an orbit that can be reached by astronauts. Hubble was launched aboard the uh, space shuttle 30 years ago, and it has been visited by astronauts five times for servicing missions. The astronauts took the space shuttle up, they caught up to Hubble, they grappled it and pulled it into the cargo bay, and then they performed servicing on it. They swapped out old instruments, they put in new technology, they uh, changed the gyroscopes, they changed the batteries, they put in new thermal insulation. As NASA likes to say, they were able to repair, refresh, and renew the Hubble Space Telescope. And that has been a major factor in being able to provide productive science for three decades. Another thing that helps Hubble last for so long is the incredible ground support it gets. Now, this is the Space Telescope Science Institute. This is where I work. And there are people here that provide amazing support for the astronomers who want to do observations on Hubble. They organize the allocation committees that decide who gets time on Hubble. They help the observers plan all their observations. They provide the software and they provide the scheduling and they provide everything the astronomers need to maximize the science output of Hubble. It, it's actually a, 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 the way you think astronomy should always have been done. But in 1990, when Hubble was launched, this was actually a relatively new idea to have an entire institute dedicated to it. And now it is the model of how these major observatories are supported. Also located at the Space Telescope Science Institute is the Barbara A. Mikulski Archive for Space Telescopes. And every observation done with Hubble ends up in this archive. We like to call it MAST. 
And any astronomer anywhere in the world can log into MAST and access Hubble data. Now, this acts as a huge imperative for astronomers to publish the science that they do on Hubble. Because when you've worked really, really hard to get your observations and you finally get your data down from Hubble, you've got one year, only one year before that data becomes public in MAST. So if you don't write your science papers, then your fiercest competitor can go into MAST and get your data and scoop you on your science. So astronomers have a huge impetus to make sure that they not only uh, get, their, get their data, but do, their, do write the papers and the science with it. Another great thing about MAST is MAST isn't just for the Hubble Space Telescope. It has grown to support many different space missions. That's why it's plural, the Archive for Space Telescopes. And that is another reason why Hubble is so effective because Hubble is part of a team. And this team is not the Avengers, it's the NASA Great Observatories. It includes the Hubble Space Telescope that looks in visible light, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, the Spitzer Space Telescope that looks in infrared light, and the Chandra X-ray Observatory. These four telescopes are all extremely powerful observatories that look in different wavelengths of light. And together, they get a more complete view of astronomical objects than could be done by any telescope alone. Let me give you an example. So this is the spiral galaxy Messier 101. And on the left, you see the infrared image from Spitzer. In the center, you see the visible light image from Hubble. And on the right, you see the X-ray image from Chandra. Now we're used to what we see in visible light, all the stars and that beautiful spiral pattern of the galaxy. But in the infrared image, we see the glowing dust clouds, a gas and dust clouds that underlie that beautiful spiral structure. And in the X-ray image, we see the high energy emission from things like black holes within the galaxy. And together, we get a more a composite view of all the physical processes going on in many different energies and a more deeper understanding of the objects in question. Now, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory was retired many years ago. And earlier this year, we retired the Spitzer Space Telescope. So right now, it's only Hubble and Chandra that are working. However, next year in 2021, a new, te new team member will come in this is the James Webb Space Telescope. JWST, or Webb as we like to call it, is a telescope that will observe mainly in the infrared, like Spitzer. But its mirror will be so much larger that it will have the incredibly high resolution, like Hubble. It's kind of like combining the best of both of those telescopes. And JWST will be able to look at planets forming around other stars, and they'll be able to look at very distant galaxies that Hubble can't see. It's going to be extremely exciting to have Webb become, uh, join the team of the great observatories, and that will happen in 2021. But today is Hubble's anniversary, so let's focus just a little bit on Hubble's discoveries. And they only let me do five of these, okay? I, if I went through all of Hubble's discoveries, I I guess we'd be here for about 30 hours, but we're gonna go through just a few of Hubble's discoveries. Now, let's take a look at planets, and this is Jupiter. And one of my favorite things in the universe is Jupiter's great red spot. I mean, I've fallen in love with this ever since Voyager took that close-up picture uh, in, the, in the 1970s. However, that brings up a question. I mean, what can Hubble do? I mean, Hubble has the clearest view from Earth, but We've sent the Galileo Voyager and Galileo, and now Juno's there at Jupiter, and they get really close up images. What can Hubble do? Well, Hubble's been up for 30 years, so it can use the power of time. What you see here now is how the great red spot has changed from 1995 to 2009 to 2014. And you'll notice that the great red spot has been shrinking it's now some 30% smaller than it was when Hubble went up. And I gotta say, astronomers are not exactly sure why, 
But Hubble and using the power of time and being able to consistent observations over the decades can help us answer such questions. Hubble also looks at stars and my favorite star clusters to look at are these globular clusters. I mean, these are dense agglomerations of tens of thousands to millions of stars all orbiting around one another. I mean, it's an amazing dynamical laboratory when you've got 10,000 objects all orbiting around each other. And this is the kind of things that people really love to study to understand the behavior in, in these complex gravitational fields. So Hubble can look deep inside these globular clusters and can actually track the motions of stars. If it takes a picture at one year and then a few years later, it can actually measure the motions with its resolution. And we can begin to understand these amazing dynamical laboratories of globular clusters. Hubble looks at nebulae. It's probably the most uh, famous thing that Hubble looks at. And this is perhaps one of its most famous nebulae, one of the so-called pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula, also known as Messier 16. And this was so popular that we went back with a new instrument and viewed it in 2015. And you can see these pillars are, act, are not dense agglomerations uh, of, of, of material. They're actually being ablated away by the high energy radiation from stars that are off screen above. And that's why they have these bright tops. And in the bright tops, that's where the dense regions are. And that's where stars are formation. So these tops of these pillars are where stars are forming. And to see that, Hubble in 2015 also looked in infrared. And in the near infrared, Hubble can see that that leftmost pillar is not solid. It's actually just the shadow of that dense region created uh, by the streaming of the, of, of the radiation from the stars. So the infrared is an example of what James Webb will be able to produce, can let us see through some of this gas and see more detail in these nebulae. On the scale of galaxies, well, again, I chose my favorite. The Whirlpool galaxy is just absolutely gorgeous spiral structure. It's a grand design spiral. And Hubble sees amazing detail along those spiral arms of all those pink star forming regions. But I gotta say, we also learn a tremendous amount from galaxies that don't have this beautiful structure, galaxies whose structure has actually been distorted. And on the left, you see a ground-based image of two galaxies called the antennae. And they have gravitationally interacted and stretched themselves out to form these big, long tidal tails that give it its nickname. But on the right, you see Hubble's close-up view of the region where the galaxies are colliding. And the gas clouds, clouds collapse, and you produce this tremendous burst of star formation. Uh, astronomers have discovered super star clusters with tens of thousands of really, really bright stars in these galaxy collisions. Going to the largest scales, well, you've got to talk about Hubble's deep field observations. These started in 1995 with the original deep field, and I'm showing here the observation of the Hubble ultra deep field where we can find thousands of galaxies in a single Hubble image by looking for very, very, very long times. This image is cumulative exposure of about 11 days of observing time. And we see galaxies all the way that are very faint, but they're also stretched out across space. And now the really cool thing about this is that looking out into space is also looking back into time. Because if a galaxy is 10 billion light years away, its light takes 10 billion years to travel to us. So we see that galaxy as it was 10 billion years ago. We can look out into space, back into time, and trace the development of galaxies. Each of these ovals represents galaxies at a different distance and therefore at a different time in the universe. And you can see how their color, their size, and their morphology changes as the universe grows up. So Hubble 
has had an, a tremendous number of observations, a tremendous number of discoveries over its 30 years. This produces a problem for those of us in the Office of Public Outreach. Basically, how are we gonna top that? What are we gonna do for Hubble's 30th anniversary image that's gonna compete with all that? Now, it's quite a project, but I think that they have really outdone themselves this time. So let me start out by orienting you where on the sky this object is. On the right, you can see the constellation of Orion. We're not going there. And across the top, you can see the, the, the plane of our galaxy, the Milky Way. We're not going there either. Instead, we're going to a satellite galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud. This is a galaxy that orbits around the Milky Way. And one of its most distinctive features is this bright blue region called the Tarantula Nebula. We're not going there either. We're going to this swath of star forming regions up above it. And we're zooming into two nebulae, one called NGC 2014, that's in red, and one called NGC 2020, that is in blue. So here is the region of the, whoops, that's not supposed to happen. There we go. Here is the region of NGC 2014 and NGC 2020 that Hubble looked at. This is the ground-based survey telescope view. And this, are you ready for it? This is the Hubble Space Telescope view. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Isn't that just so beautiful? I mean, get your oohs and your ahs out there. This is an amazing image. And you guys aren't even seeing the half of it, okay? Let me go to the full scale image, all right? And this image is 200 million pixels of Hubble goodness, all right? It's just, it's just uh, somebody was on, on the internet going, uh, A-Y-K-M. And I was like, what the heck's that? And I was like, are you kidding me? Okay, so there has been fantastic responses to this today on the internet. and. Our initial response was that it sort of looked like it was underwater because you can see on the right side this sort of thing that resembles coral reef um, and the, uh, the blue thing down there that could be sort of like a jellyfish dancing around on the coral reef and so we nicknamed it the cosmic reef and that uh, you know it might represent an underwater uh, underwater scene in the universe. Of course it's not an underwater scene in the universe and here to tell us what it really is, is Dr. Elena Sabi. Elena, please take over. Thank you, Frank. Definitely a great way to celebrate 30 years of Hubble operation. What you're seeing here is a huge cloud of gas and dust that are surrounding the star forming region NGC 2014. This image is huge. The cloud of gas is about 400 light years in diameter almost 26 million times the distance of the Earth to the Sun. And in this region, we have hundreds of stars, 10 to 20 times more massive than our Sun, that are releasing a huge amount of energy in the forms of light and heat. These stars shine as bl bright blue spot in the image, and most of them are actually hidden from our eyes by this thick uh, wall of gas and dust that you can see in the cyan shades. Look at how spectacular is the Hubble image. There are all these layers and ripples. These are all created by the radiation of the star that is blowing the way, the gas that they used before to form from. All these cavities are really created by the power of the stars. And you can look in the detail at this large bubble inside of the image. Here, you can see that around some of the stars, there are a ring of dust. This is just a smaller scale of what you saw in the uh, lower corner before. These are the stars that are just getting rid of all the material they were using to form before. And this image is incredibly powerful in showing how harsh the first few million years in the life of a star can be. 
So in the lower left corner, you have NGC 2020. This is a star that at birth was 50 times more massive than our sun. And it formed with the other stars in the center of the big cloud of gas. But at a certain point, it went through a very strong collision. And so it was kicked out of, the Magellan, of, the, of NGC 2014 at 240 light years away. And now it is zooming through the Magellanic Cloud at a speed between 27,000 and 46,000 miles per hour. Now NGC 2020 is approaching its death and it does this through a sequence of pulses that are expelling the outer layer. So what you see in the blue ring around the stars are the external layers, the surface of the stars that have been ejected about half a million years ago. And then the star had a second pulses about 250,000 years ago. And it will continue doing this until it will explode as a supernova. But if some of the stars are, are already dying in NGC 2014, many are emerging only now from the cradle. And you can see them at the top of this huge pillar of dust and gas in the center of the image. These are similar to the pillar of creation that Frank was talking about before. And then if you go um, at, outside the cloud, you can see that there are several bright red and orange globules. These are stellar nursery where st nurseries where stars more massive than our sun, 10, 20, maybe even 30 times more massive than our sun are forming around now. And they are already injecting energy in the environment. And so they are puffing up their stellar nursery and it starts to shine. And in about half a million years, we will be able to finally see them. So go to the HubbleSci.org website and see with your eyes how spectacular is the Hubble image. Uh, it says I'm muted, Grant. Am I gr muted? No, now we can't hear you. Okay, you can hear me now. Thank you. <laughs> that was fantastic, Elena. And I have a whole bunch of questions for you, and I'm, I'm sure our audience does too. So if you have questions for Elena or for me, please type them into the chat, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. Now, let's do the big finish. Let's take this into a whole new dimension. Let's actually take it into the third dimension. And to do that, we're actually going to flip the image upside down, simply because all right, to be honest with you, the camera path through the three-dimensional visualization works better from this orientation. You'll see, you'll see, it's a fantastic camera path. So what our team did at Space Telescope is we took this image and we analyzed it with Elena's help to, into the three-dimensional structure of NGC 2014 and the three-dimensional structure of 2020. And we separated out into layers in 3D modeling software and then fly you through it. Now, I can't really describe this with all my hand waving and everything, but I can show it to you. So here is what we call our model build sequence. And we're going to start with those star forming regions at the very back and then start building up the layers of NGC 2014. And you can see there are a lot of layers of very, of this, reflect this very complex structure in the center of this star forming region. Then we start building the right side where you've got these tendrils of gas flowing and then the left side where you've got that uh, bubble and coral reef like structure and we fill out the full 2014. Then we add in NGC 2020 and the stars of the cluster and finally the stars across the whole image. And so now you're seeing what you're seeing looks like the Hubble image, but it's actually a 3D model. And now let's take you on a flight through that model.
what did I tell you? Is that fantastic or what? I, and I love this ending position because here you really get to see the structure of NGC 2020. That Wolf Ray A star in the center has been ejecting material out into space. Uh, and you can see that it's actually injecting it along a double lobe structure. If we go back to the Hubble image, you're looking down the axis of that emission and it looks relatively circular. Instead, we get to show you in the 3D visualization the correct double lobe structure and give you a proper mental model to imagine this. Now, if you would like to get access to all these images and visualizations and much, much more for Hubble's 30th anniversary, go to our website, hubblesite.org. Okay, so I'm going to leave you with one final thing. This I got to say, is my favorite picture of Hubble. It was taken by the space shuttle astronauts after they put Hubble back out into space, ready to do more science. And there it is. It's, it's, it's hopeful. Hubble looking out into the universe. And you imagine, what is it looking at? What amazing images is it going to get? What amazing discovery is it going to make? And this is how I like to view the universe, the joy and wonder of science discovery that we get to do here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And Hubble is our vehicle. And it is something that we've grown very fond of over the last three decades. It has produced amazing images and wonderful science discoveries. And I hope you hold it as dear in your hearts as we do in ours. Thank you for your attention here today. Now I'm going to bring in our behind the scenes person, Grant Justice, and uh, he's been monitoring the chat to see if you have any questions. Grant, do we have any questions for our uh, speakers here? We do, absolutely. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this. And I do want to take just a moment to say that this is a celebration of Hubble and the achievements of everyone. But it's important to remember that without the audience, without the people who are here watching and interested in us, then we wouldn't be able to do anything we would we currently do. So it's important to remind yourselves that everyone is a part of this and we thank you for your support for all of us. Um, so yes, we have had a few questions in the audience. And the first one that I picked out, I think you'll like this one, is why is NGC 2020 so blue? Elena, that's definitely yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. NGC 2020 is a very special star. It's a Wolf Rayet oxygen rich star. It's a star that, as, as I said before, ejected most of its uh, atmosphere. And when the gas is expelled, it starts to emit light uh, in, the co in the various components, chemical components that you can find in the atmosphere of the star. So this star is particularly rich in oxygen and it has very strong light, uh, a very strong emission line. And one of these emission lines, the oxygen-6, very high energy um, line, it's falling by coincidence within the um, within the space that you can see in the filter that we chose for the blue light in this image. Frank, would you put back up the image so that we can look at it while we're discussing oh, it? Sounds good. Let's go there. Uh, this is the inverted version, but it's still, still the same pixels. OK, continue, Elena. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, it, uh, so basically, uh, one trick that we, we do to understand where the various uh, um, chemical element or the various component of a, of a region in space are, we tend to slide the to slice the light that come from these images using filters that they are only letting a little fraction of the light coming through. Similar to what happened when you put sunglasses and all of the time, all, all of the sudden, the world changed colors. You're letting only a small fraction of light coming through your, your eyes. And this is what we do with Hubble. We let only oxygen coming out and we see where oxygen in and then is and then we use another filter that lets only hydrogen coming through. And that is why we can see the beautiful red cloud uh, around the Stratformian region. Okay, thank you. Grant, we have another question. We do, we absolutely do. So um, 
the next one is one of my favorites. This came directly from the comment because we talk about this all the time. Will Hubble work with James Webb? And what is the future for Hubble? <laughs> I think, did, did we see this question? This one's a perfect question. All right. So yes, as I talked about, Hubble is part of a team of great observatories. And uh, we absolutely want Hubble and Webb to be observing the same objects at the same time to get these different views to learn more science. Uh, that is uh, one of our one of the crucial things that will happen uh, because ex extending the wavelength region over which you look at something really does give you a lot more information and so the future for Hubble is actually a little unknown Hubble is operating really well and that's kind of surprising because the last servicing mission was back in 2009 and the space shuttle program is not no longer operating so we can't go back up and service it anymore so the folks at Space Telescope have 30 years of experience of operating this telescope and they have learned all its quirks and behaviors and they know how to repair things just by software fixes. So they are doing a fantastic job of keeping it in tip top shape. You know, eventually the gyroscopes will fail. Eventually the batteries um, may, may run out. I think the gyroscopes are the most likely thing. But um, right now the future is uh, looking good and we're hoping for another five years who knows, maybe we can speculate that we'll get another 10 years out of Hubble. Um, so it's, it's got a bright, it still has a bright future, even after 30 years. All right. And the uh, next one that I have is how many stars are in this nebula? Give or take, <laughs> give or take, of course. <laughs> there are several thousand stars in this nebula. Some are much smaller than our sun. And several are considerably bigger. So yeah. It's a big family. Um, and let me just add to that because we are looking at an object that is in a different galaxy. And as we look at that, we have to look out through our own galaxy to that other galaxy. And usually in a lot of Hubble images, we have a lot of foreground stars that are in our own galaxy and that are extremely bright and actually can get in the way of looking at distant things. But uh, this is at what we call a high galactic latitude. So uh, one of the cool things about this image is that there aren't too many of the uh, Milky Way stars in the way, um, getting in the way of what we're seeing, almost all the stars that we see in this image are inside the Large Magellanic Cloud. And that was a cool feature that uh, Ellen and I discussed, oh, months ago when we first started uh, looking at this object. It was great. All right, and I think I'll have one more question for us. That'll be good. Us. It's about our time, it's about, uh, we're, we've done our half hour. Yeah, so um, obviously this is a beautiful image and I've seen a couple things come through the comments and whatnot. Uh, there is a huge juxtaposition between the coloring of this image. How does Hubble detect that color and what does it mean? So Hubble, when you look at the Hubble image, it's black and white. So what we do to be able to understand where the various colors are is to use filters, as I said before, and to slice the light in pieces. And then uh, we use uh, incredible artists here at Space Telescope to allow us to tune the nuances of the images. But the colors in this image are quite close to how this image look in uh, real life. Yeah, um, let me emphasize that the, every photon that you're seeing here is real. It came from Hubble. Um, and to get the stars, they had to use some broadband filters in addition to the narrowband filters that Elena talked about. Um, and to get the stars, and the color balancing is what the artists really do because you have what, four different, four or five different filters on this image um, and to bring okay. out the colors that the astronomers know is there uh, from these five separate black and white images, each taken in different filters, and you apply the color to each filter according to what rather, you know, apply red to the red filter, or apply blue to the blue filter, and so on. Um, but uh, they did an awful lot of work on this uh, with a, you know, 200 million pixel image. That, that, takes, that takes a lot of time. All right, uh, that's all we have time for, speaking of time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We are incredibly proud to be able to present this 30th anniversary image to you. Um, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, go to hubblesite.org. 
download the images, download the visualizations, watch the videos on YouTube, and just enjoy and keep on exploring your universe. Thank you all and have a great Hubble 30th birthday. Happy birthday, Hubble. <laughs>